Wow, Father, tonight I ask that uh, you would speak to us in a powerful way. That, Lord, uh, your word would come to life for us and we would experience the power of your gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, uh, in, in 2012, was in Uganda with my friend James. And uh, we woke up in the morning uh, tired but ready for another day of ministry. And uh, we, we went out to, uh, uh, the, 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 we were like in one little room of this little house. We're out in the bush in, in the village, but we're in one little room. And then we step out into the other room for breakfast. And the whole time we're getting ready and getting our stuff together, we're hearing this sound out in the yard that's, it sounds like, oh, oh, you know, and I'm like, is this some African creature that I don't know about, you know? And then I'm like, no, it sounds like a kid. And we're commenting on it. Like, this is a weird sound I've never heard before. And so when we finally come out, we look out the, the uh, door and there's this, we can tell that there's a group of people and some kind of commotion in the middle. And we're like, okay, I guess some, uh, you know, kid maybe got hurt kicking a bottle around playing soccer. That, they play soccer with bottles over there very often because they don't really have toy, you know, it's, we're just out in the village. And um, so we just sit down and they bring in the food for breakfast, you know, some pineapple and mandazi, which is like this sweet bread. And uh, we're sitting there looking at the food and uh, as Pastor Paul, who I'm working with there, he went into town. So he's, he's not present, but he's my translator. And his wife comes in with the food and puts it on the table. And she speaks a little bit of English. Actually, now she speaks more than she used to. But at that time, not very much. And I said, I, I pointed outside. I said, what is happening? She said, ah, uh, mm, uh, evil spirit? I said, oh, I looked at James and we looked at our food and we were like, we can't just sit here and eat breakfast while something's going on out there. So we were like, okay, we'll go take care of this. So we go out there. Now what the scene we came up on was pandemonium. There's this little girl, she's probably nine or 10 years old and she's laying on the ground and there's a woman sitting on each of her arms a woman sitting on each of her legs, one kneeling behind her head, holding her head in place. And there's women standing around her in a circle over her, pointing and shouting, and it's all kinds of, it's just bananas. And I walked away from bananas to come to this. And it was crazy. It's like, what do, you, what do I even do? Now, James and I, uh, like, I, I'd been mentoring him for some time, and I taught him, like, Deliverance ministry is ministry to a person, not to a demon, right? And so you minister with the nature of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus. And, you know, your authority in Christ is not based on the volume of your voice. It's based on the fact that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, according to Ephesians 2.6. So you can whisper with authority and it'll be done, right? So James and I know what to do. We squeeze our way into this circle and kneel down next to this little girl and we start ministering quietly. Just come out right now in Jesus' name. And nothing is happening. This girl's got one eye crossed way over this way and one eye straight forward and, and she's shouting things out as she's thrashing around and these women are shouting things back and I'm like, what is going on? I'm praying like, Lord, what's, what am I supposed to do? How do I help this girl? James starts singing this song that they had just taught us in, uh, in their language of Luganda. And it goes, Hallelujah, Yesu Mulunji, Yesu Mulunji, Jesus is good. Yesu Mulunji, Katonda Wafe. My God, so good to me. And he starts singing. As he sings, all the thrashing stops. One eye wonky. <laughs> Still like sitting there, but, but no thrashing around. And it was like, huh, this doesn't seem to be doing anything like, you know, as soon as the song was over, the people all go back to their shouting and the thrashing starts again. And we're like, well, that seems to be getting more of a rise out of this thing. Then I had this thought, you know, demons are liars. And it would make sense that they would act like it's not working when it is and act like it is working when it's not. So maybe there was something to that. And just as I'm about to like figure out what to do, 
this crowd of ladies parts like the Red Sea and this other lady comes storming in with a Bible in her hand. I didn't know who she was, but she sure looked important because everybody like got out of her way. And she comes up to this girl and takes her Bible and like, like sticks it in the girl's throat and starts shouting something in her language. And I'm like, what is happening? And the demon's going, ah, you know, screaming. And I'm like, what is this? This is nonsense. And then, this was the one that got me mad. With her other hand, she slaps the girl. Uh-huh. That's what I said. <laughs> I'm like, this is not okay. I, it was like, all of a sudden, this, this fury from the Lord overtakes me, right? I said, stop. <laughs> I didn't know if anybody understood me. I said, stop. Tell them to stop. I'm like hoping somebody can translate for me. Everybody stops talking and everything. The woman backs up. And I, I looked at Pastor Paul's wife, still not knowing if she could understand me. Her name's Helen. And I said, tell them this kind only goes out by gentleness. <laughs> I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm desperate in this moment, right? And she says something to them. I don't know if she was translating for me or if she was saying, I have no idea what this man is saying, but he wants us to stop. But she said something and they, they stopped. And I looked at the women who were sitting on this girl who is still thrashing around. And I said, all of you, move, you, go, go, go. They all get off the girl. She's still thrashing, but she's not going anywhere. I kneeled down in front of her and I grabbed her hand and I looked her in her one eye that was going forward. <laughs> and I smiled. And I said, in Jesus' name, come out of her right now. And both her eyes, straight forward. And she blinks and she starts looking around like it was the first time she'd looked through her own eyes. It was crazy. James goes, she looks pretty tired. Let's get her a mat to sleep on. Someone goes and finds a reed mat. We put it under the tree and she lays down. And then we went and ate breakfast. Ah. <sighs> We go off to another village somewhere. That girl's gone. We don't know what's going I mean, she was like instantly asleep when she got under the tree. She was so tired. We go off on our uh, missions stuff in another church in another village, and then we come back. And um, as James and I are getting some things ready in our room before it gets dark, because once it's dark, you can't see anything because there's no electricity in the bush. We're getting everything ready, and Pastor Paul knocks on our door. He said, yes. He said, uh, the girl that you prayed for earlier, Pastor Paul was in town, he wasn't there. He goes, she's come back with her mother. Her mother wants to speak to you. I used to be a youth pastor. Those are terrifying words. <laughs> I have done something wrong, <laughs> something terrible, right? And so I'm like, okay, we're going to finish getting ready. I'll be right out. You know, I'm, I'm like, this is going to take all evening, you know? So we get all our stuff together. And we come out, and I'm trembling because, like, this mom's going to tell me off, you know. I come out, and the mom is standing there, and the little girl is sitting in the chair. And um, we, f we learn the story. Turns out this little girl's father died. And um, uh, the mother remarried a Muslim man. And uh, shortly after that, the little girl at school starts seeing apparitions of her dead father saying, come with me, come with me. And she knows her father's dead and she's confused and she goes completely out of her mind. Like just couldn't talk anymore, was like uh, scared all the time, always looking around and it was like something, something had snapped in her. And uh, the, the mother had tried everything she could to get this girl help, which in the bush of Uganda where, you know, there's not a lot you can do, but she took her to the imam, the Muslim leader, and there was nothing they could do. She took her to the witch doctors, there was nothing they could do. Then it was the night before she showed up in our yard and the demon started speaking out of her mouth. We're going to kill her. We're going to kill her. Then we're going, we're, first we're going to kill all of you and then we're going to kill her. And so it took six men this was like all night long, this, this girl had been screaming these things out. Six men to carry her to the pastor's house because they thought the imam couldn't help, the witch doctor couldn't help. Surely, maybe the pastor can do something. He, they, he, we were kind of the last ditch effort. And then the pastor wasn't home, so she got us. <laughs> and the mother came because she wanted to give her life to Jesus. 
<laughs> so we pray with her. She gives her life to Jesus. I mean, we share a little gospel message with her and pray with her. And then um, Pastor Paul says, you know, I was just thinking, uh, this little girl, I've, I've seen her come to the church a couple times, but she's never uh, given her life to Jesus. And I said, well, ask her if she wants to. He goes, ask her. After what she's just been through, it's automatic. <laughs> of course she wants to. She prays, gives her life to Jesus. There, there were things I learned that day, just in the experience of the whole thing. It was like, why, why didn't the demons leave until that moment, right? Well, it was because if they had left any sooner, all of the pandemonium would have gotten the glory. It's like, this is what it takes to get somebody free. And the reason people were doing all those jumping and shouting and pointing and slapping and Bible binding, sticking to the neck and all of that stuff, the reason they're doing it was because at some point they saw somebody do it and it worked. Now, whether it was actually working or whether the demons were putting on a show to make it look like it worked, I don't know. Whether those demons came back and made things worse, I don't, I don't know all that stuff. But somehow they picked up in their culture, this is what we do. And when everybody was made to stop, and all I did was smile and speak with gentleness, it was done. It was like the Lord knew, I've got the right part of my body here to reveal that piece of my nature to these people so they can learn something. I'm not better than the folks in Uganda. I've learned ton of stuff from them. I've learned way more from them than they've learned from me. But in that moment, that was the peace Jesus wanted to reveal. I want to talk to you tonight about deliverance ministry. This is um, one of those subjects that uh, ought to come up in church more often because it sure came up a lot in Jesus's ministry. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, it's one of those subjects that, uh, you know, we, we might talk about outside of the church meeting, but I'm like, let's, let's do it. We're going to confront this thing. But there's, a, there's kind of like this, this under the surface reason why I felt tonight I'm supposed to share about this. You may remember from our last encounter night, we said yes to Jesus with regard to people who are down and out and struggling and in the fringes of society and saying, Lord, we'll take them, bring them. And right on the heels of that, those sorts of people started showing up at people's house churches. Crazy. Like not even trying to make it happen. It just started happening. People started contacting me with encounters they were having with people. And it, it was just like, well, the Lord must have heard you say yes. It's awesome. But part of this process is you're going to encounter people who have demonic influence in their lives and they need freedom. Now, listen, there is such a thing as mental illness. There are other things that there, there's like purely physical stuff out there. Like, you know, a person had a closed head, head injury, right? And they might act different because of that experience. That doesn't mean they have a demon. They got hurt, right? There's, there's damage there or something. Um, there are certain prescription drugs that people go on that have side effects that cause their mind to go all kinds of different places and it, it's super complicated. And, and so I understand that there are some purely physical things out there and I, I want to start out by pointing out, like I, I don't believe that every single problem is a demon. What I do believe is there are probably more demons that we're interacting with on a pretty regular basis than we might realize. When I'm in Africa, it's easy to spot them because everybody there already believes there are demons and so the demons don't have any reason to hide. Over here, it seems their strategy is to fly under the radar and only do things that are diagnosable. <laughs> I have learned uh, in years of, of doing this, that, that this is real. And there are just as many demons in America as there are in Africa, if not more. <laughs> yeah, they all voted for the person you didn't. <laughs> Sorry. That was just a joke. But you get the idea, like they're around. And, and this is real. And we've had it happen in our house churches where it's like, 
Like in, at the end of house church, people are praying for each other and all of a sudden, a demon starts manifesting in someone and we're like, okay, looks like we're doing this now. <laughs> but here's the thing, like, I want to make sure everybody's equipped for this. This isn't just for the pastors. This isn't just for the, the super mature Christians. Here's the, here's the thing that really blows my mind. Jesus said, I think it was in Matthew 7, he said that at the final judgment, there's going to be people who say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and work mighty miracles in your name and drive out demons in your name? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That tells me that someone who doesn't even know Jesus can cast out demons in his name. Like, you casting out demons in the name of Jesus is not impressive. <laughs> like that story I just told, not that impressive because you don't even have to know him to do it. His name is that powerful. We just sang that song earlier, Your Great Name, right? And how the kingdom of darkness is trembling in fear when they hear the name of Jesus. Wow. My goodness. Hmm. Here's the thing. I want to read to you a story in the book of Mark that is one of the most famous demon stories in the Bible. This is Mark chapter 5. And uh, this one, I, I don't know. Like it comes right on the heels of that story where Jesus is sleeping in a boat and his disciples are freaking out because there's a storm going on and the waves are crashing and the boat's going to capsize or sink. And they're like, Jesus, you got to wake up. And Jesus, I just imagine him like wiping the water off of his eyes, you know, because it's pouring everywhere and waves crashing in. There's craziness going on. And he gets up, walks to the front of this wobbling boat, half, half awake, peace. Be still. And then he turns to his disciples and goes, where was your faith? <laughs> like, I was taking a nap. You could have done that. <laughs> right on the heels of that, they come up on the other side of the lake. That makes me wonder if that storm was sent by demons to stop them from getting there. Because here's what happened next. Mark 5, verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. That's the description of a deeply tormented person. There's this, this supernatural strength that he has that is accompanied with rage. There's this emotional cry. He's cutting himself. You know, there, there are people today that cut themselves. And... and like, when, when you have a conversation, I, I remember one, one girl I was talking to uh, when I was a youth pastor, and she was confessing that she was cutting herself, and I said, I, I don't mean this in a condescending way, but I, I want to understand, can you tell me why? Now, I don't know if this is the case for everybody, but she said, for me, it's the only escape from what I'm feeling and she said, I feel like my blood is necessary for me to be free from what I'm going through. And I said, that's coming from a good place. The good place that it's coming from knows there is blood needed for your freedom. The problem is you believed a lie and you believed in the wrong blood. And I told her about Jesus and she got legitimately free. It was awesome. Here's this guy, all this going on. Verse six, when he saw Jesus from a distance, now think about this, the guy's got a bunch of demons in him. What I would expect to happen is he sees Jesus from a distance and he hightails it into the tombs. I'm out of here. 
Instead, he sees Jesus at a distance. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. There's a few things going on here. Did you know if you are walking in the power of the spirit, the demons will come to you. You don't have to go hunting for them. Like it may look, sometimes it's like you're praying for somebody. I've had this happen many times. I'm praying for someone for healing. Let's say it was their right shoulder is hurting. And I've got my hand on their shoulder and I'm praying. And as I pray, they go, well, my shoulder feels good, but now for some reason my left hip hurts. That's not a normal medical condition, right? There's not a medical explanation for why your shoulder is now healed, but now your hip is hurting. I had a woman in Africa, I prayed for her right knee to be healed. She doesn't even speak English. I put my hand on her knee, I said, be healed in Jesus' name. I said, test it out, my translator translates, and she goes like this, she goes, it's good, but now my other knee hurts. I said, was it hurting before? No. (laughs) It's just moving around, right? So now I put my hand on her other knee, I said, be healed in Jesus' name. She tests, she goes like this. She goes, this one is better, now that one hurts again. I looked at Pastor Paul (laughs) and I just smiled, right? He knew what was going on. I said, all right, right now. He's not translating for me right now. I said, in Jesus' name, I command you to leave this woman's body and never come back. The woman says something. I said, Pastor Paul, what's she saying? Uh, He said, she says, I'm feeling panic. And I look up and she's going, (laughs) right? I said, tell her this is okay. It's the demon leaving. (laughs) So he tells her. I said, come out of her right now in Jesus' name. Leave her. She screams, falls to the ground, gets up. Both knees are fine. She starts singing and dancing and shouting and praising Jesus. She didn't, like, she didn't even know what I was saying. You can't blame that on psychology, you know? I've also had it where the demons, just like this, they see you somewhere and they, the person actually comes to you. Like when I lived in Plymouth, we had a house church there. Joe was there for this. And uh, this, this knock comes at the door. The house church meeting had just ended. Half the people had left and there's a knock at the door. And it was a woman from down the street. And I, you know, I had prayed for her before. And in fact, the first time she came to our house church, this was a few months earlier, she came because someone accidentally parked in front of uh, her driveway, <coughs> Jonathan Ammon. Um, and <laughs> those who remember our missionary from uh, last, last year. Anyhow, uh, so he, uh, he parked accidentally in front of her house. And so she came up to the house and just knocked and said, hey, could someone move their car? And so he goes down to move his car. And while he went, she sat on our couch instead of going with them. And I said, hey, nice to meet you. And you know, we had this conversation. I said, by any chance, do you have pain in your right shoulder? She goes, well, sure I do. I was shot in my shoulder when I was carjacked last year. <laughs> yeah, she's got, she pulls up her sleeve and she's got a bullet wound in her shoulder. It was this shoulder, sorry. And, and uh, I'm like, well, is it hurting now? She goes, it always hurts. We prayed for her, all the pain leaves. She goes, I can't believe this. I always believed God was out there and, you know, I've gone over to Northridge a few times and I did some painting for them, but, you know, I I pray in my own special way and, you know, this was her story. And uh, long story short, ended up leading her to Jesus and she's come into house church and uh, she had some issues from a closed head injury that were giving her trouble and so she was a little socially awkward, but, but engaging and learning and growing. And one night at the end, she said, I believe the Lord told me I'm supposed to move out of my boyfriend's house, that we're not married, and until we're married, I'm not supposed to be living with him. I said, you know, I think you're right. I think you got that one right. I think you're hearing the Lord. Then we didn't see her for a while. And then there's a knock on our door. After house church, half the people had left. I opened the door, and it's her. And I said, hey, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Then she said a string of incoherent words. I mean, the words were coherent, but they didn't stick together. It was just random words strung together in a line. And, you know, the first thought is, is this woman having a stroke? You know, that kind of thing. Like, what, what is going on? And I could tell there was probably some alcohol involved, but, like, this was, there was a lot happening right now. 
And um, I said, uh, can I pray for you? And after that string of incoherent words, uh, I said, can I pray for you? And in a deep, weird voice, she goes, no. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> and so I just started praying. Jesus, thank you for your love for my friend here, and I command those spirits to leave right now in the name of Jesus. You have no more authority over her. Let her go. Put her back in her right mind in Jesus' name. And then she goes, thank you. You know you're the only one who can get them to stop. <laughs> what? Yeah, crazy. And I was like, so what's going on? You know, and she shares with us a little bit, and, you know, I... I uh, she asked me, how do you, how do you, well, I, I said something to her about, you know, we've got to find out how the enemy got access to your life like this, right? And she goes, well, I don't know. I've been doing everything. I'm trying to pray. I'm trying to read my Bible. I said, let me ask you a question. Last time I saw you, you told me that God told you to do something. Do you remember what it was? She goes, yeah. I said, did you do it? She said, no. I said, well, that." seems like a pretty simple solution. I mean, God himself told you to do something and you said, no, I think that would leave you vulnerable to an attack. Not that God left you, but just that you're choosing willfully to stand out from under his covering and his authority. She went right back into those incoherent words. I said, you're going to have to go home now. And then she left. Now, it's a much longer story, and uh, I, I recently heard from this woman, and there are some good things happening in her life and some troubling things happening, and, and the Lord has brought her out of that living situation. There's, there's a lot going on. People's lives are complicated. But, you know, in that moment, I, I learned some things from that experience as well. Sometimes they'll come to you. It's like moths to a flame, you ever see the movie Bugs Life from Pixar? It's like, don't go to the light. I can't help it. It's so beautiful. Right? Yeah. They just do it. Now, here's the other thing I find interesting is, you know, verse 7, he's crying out, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Verse 8, for Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. What's that tell me? It tells me that Jesus told the spirit to leave and it didn't leave right away. Huh. Jesus told it to leave, and then it didn't leave. Now, I don't know about you, but if that verse wasn't in the Bible, I might be intimidated if I told a spirit to leave in Jesus' name and it didn't leave right away. But if they did that to Jesus, right, I think I'm okay if I say leave in Jesus' name and it doesn't happen yet. <laughs> Gosh, there's so many stories. Let me just continue with this. Verse 9, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? Now, there's a question here worth asking. Interpretatively, I don't know if that's a word. When you're thinking about how to interpret this passage, um, you could take it as he's asking the demon's name, or you could take it as Jesus asked him, what is your name? Almost like... Uh, like troubleshooting even. I don't know. I'm sure Jesus is way more discerning than we are, right? But it's like I've, I've had times when I'm like, I'm not sure if that demon came out or not. Like it, it seems like it did, but also I'm not sure. And I'll have a conversation with the person and either it's clear that they're in their right mind or it's clear they're not. And so I don't know that that's what Jesus was doing necessarily, but the response there was, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Interesting. Here's what I do know. I've driven out hundreds of demons. I can't even count them. I, I don't keep track. And uh, in the name of Jesus, I've never once had to know their name for it to work. What's weird is, for some reason, we, we look at this story and we say, okay, that's how you do deliverance. I guess I got to find out the demon's name. And there are people who do that and then they have fruit, but I would argue the fruit you had might have been because of the name of Jesus, not because of the name of the demon. 
Right? There's, there's really only one name that matters here. Um, there's, there's a verse uh, that's coming to me. I think it's back in Matthew 8. Yeah. Um, in verse 16, it says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Like, that's how Jesus normally ministered healing ministry or, or deliverance ministry. It was just with a word. Boom. It's gone. And I'm glad it doesn't tell us what the word was or we'd make a doctrine out of that instead of relying on the Holy Spirit. But you get the idea. It was just a word. Simple. Right? It would have been in Aramaic anyhow, so whatever. There are times when I've just said, go. And it's done. Times when I've just said, it's over. Come out. And it's done. Most of the time, it's this very simple, very quick thing, not a long, drawn-out process. And so it's simple. It's really simple. Once in a while, you get one of those pesky boogers, like this one that you just can't flick off your finger, those kind of boogers, right? And it's like, like I, I did the little flick and it's still there, right? And you just keep going, right? You don't stop. <laughs> I'm not looking at Joe right now. I'm afraid he's like biting into his finger or something. You would do that to me. You would, yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Verse 11. Oh, oh, oh let, me, let me look again. My name is Legion. He replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. You know you can send demons out of the area? That's interesting. Now, it's cool because the land of the Gerasenes, this was like uh, this place where there were, uh, you know, Gentile, like not, not Jewish people living there. They're, they've got pig herding going on, which the Jews would have stayed away from. There's tombs. Everything about this place spells unclean in the Jewish ceremonial world, right? There's an unclean, uh, like if you touch a dead body, you're ceremonially unclean until you go through the cleansing rituals, right? They touch a pig, ceremonially unclean until you go through the cleansing rituals. Um, and then especially in this region where there are unclean people, everything about it is unclean. Hmm. Remember what it was that Jesus said, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Another version says you unclean spirit. Isn't it interesting that an unclean spirit would want to hang around in an unclean place? There was a... Um, a time when, uh, actually the very first house church my wife and I had, uh, it was, she was just my girlfriend at the time. We met in her parents' basement and uh, uh, Robin was working on the farm and one of her coworkers said, I've got a ghost in my house. And my wife, my girlfriend, she goes, what? <laughs> she says, yeah, uh, it's like weird stuff going on. My boyfriend and our, and our uh, like he's got two little boys, uh, three and five from a, a previous marriage and, and like the kids will be playing and then some man's voice will go, hello. It like freaks everybody out. And then like the kids, like they sleep in separate rooms and, and late at night, both of them sit up in their beds in the separate rooms like across the hall from each other and both of them start yelling, scary man, scary man. The deadbolt on the doors clicking back and forth. And Robin's like, all right. So Robin comes and tells me this crazy story. Isn't that wild? What should I do? I said, well, tell her we're Christians, and if you want them gone, give us a call. We know what to do about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we're Christians. We know how to deal with this stuff. So we, uh, we, we, she tells her friend. And her friend kind of chuckles it off, right? Like, pfft, okay. And then that Sunday, one of, I think it was me, it might've been Robin, one of us gets a call on our cell phone and it's this girl. And uh, she goes, were you serious about being able to get these things to leave? I was like, yeah. She said, okay, because last night my boyfriend woke up in the morning with a human bite mark on his arm and we don't know where it came from and we're freaked out. We've sent the kids off to grandma's house and uh, like, we, we need something. I'm like, okay. So I call up my friends from my house church and about four or five of us went over there. And as we're driving, like this was like a 45 minute drive to get there. And as we're driving, I'm praying, Lord, what's going on? How, how do you want to do this? Like, give me some insight. I don't want to go in blind. And I had a vision. Now, 
vision sounds super spiritual, but it was just a picture in my head. Like when you think in pictures, right? Like if I say picture a pencil, you can see a pencil even though you don't see a pencil, right? So it's not like I was, anyone in the car was in any danger that I couldn't see. But, you know, I had this, this picture in my mind of uh, this old man and a little girl. And I'm like, what is going on? What am I even supposed to do with this, Lord? Lord, would you show me more? And then, you know those old, like, um, masks that they would use in the old world theater that have the handles under the chins and the, you know, that sort of thing? The old man and the little girl take these masks off like that, and behind the masks, I see demons laughing and pointing and slapping their knees like they're just mocking somebody. And I'm like, what in the world is this? Now, here's the thing. In the scripture, there's not like a list of demon species or anything like that. Like, you don't need any of that stuff. Jesus used certain uh, terms for demons, like you unclean spirit or you deaf and mute spirit come out. I mean, the demon wasn't deaf or mute or it wouldn't have heard him say come out, you know. He called them according to what they were doing, right? This unclean, impure spirit had this guy running around in the tombs, right? You get the idea? The deaf and mute spirit made someone deaf and mute. Doesn't mean everybody who's deaf and mute has a demon, but sometimes that's the case, right? So in that moment, all I saw was this picture of the slap in the knee and pointing, and I go, okay, I guess these are mocking spirits. I'd never heard of a mocking spirit. I didn't read this in a book somewhere. I'm just calling it what I see, right? And so we get to the house. We go in, we all sit down in the living room. They explain to everybody the problem of everything crazy going on. He shows us the bite mark. And then uh, I said, okay, let me tell you what I saw on the way over here. I, saw, I explained the vision, and as I explained it, I had a word of knowledge. That's where the Lord reveals to you something only Jesus knows, right? And so it was like I suddenly knew what that whole scene was about that I saw. I said, these spirits are mocking the two of you. Oh, in fact, when I said the old man and the little girl that I saw, their jaws fell open, like the husband, or not the husband and wife, the boyfriend and girlfriend, and they go, that's what the kids say they keep seeing is an old man and a little girl. They hadn't given us those details. We just heard scary man. And now I'm like, okay, I'm onto something. So now I'm a little bolder, right? And um, a little bolder is a pebble, by the way. Anyhow, um, sorry. Sorry. I can't, get, this is ADD, okay, back on track. So I, I, uh, I told them the story and suddenly I knew something more and I said, the, the old man uh, spirit, I looked at the, the boyfriend, I said, the old man spirit is mocking you because three years ago you were a strong Christian and you gave it all up to take on your old man again. He goes, how do you know that? I mean, I'd never met this person, right? I said, Jesus knows, he sees it. This is real. He goes, oh, I believe it. I turned to the girlfriend. I said, and the little girl spirit is mocking you because something traumatic happened to you when you were three or four years old. And ever since then, when you picture yourself in your mind, you see yourself as a scared little girl. And you've been spiritually stunted in your heart since that time. She starts weeping. Robin goes over and wraps her arms around her and starts praying for her. <sighs> to make a very long story short, uh, the kids came home the next day from grandma's house. I told this couple, listen, you're going to have to decide what you're going to do. I'm going to tell these spirits to leave you alone tonight. But like, oh, and this is what triggered this story in my memory. Remember the darkness thing? I said, and, and leaving the area? I said, oh, oh, because the, the, the boyfriend, he had told me, I've been going around the house saying, leave now, get out, get out of my house, and they won't leave. I said, listen, if you put a plate of sugar in front of your door and a bunch of ants started coming in and you stood there yelling at the ants, telling them to leave, what's going to happen? He said, well, they're going to keep coming. I got to get rid of the plate. I said, bingo. I said, the kingdom of darkness is attracted to darkness. And if you want to live in freedom, you've got to give up your lifestyle of darkness. And I said, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to look really intense. Like you're going to give up a whole lot of things in your life. A lot of things change. And because the two of you, your lives are so enmeshed right now, this is going to have to be a together decision if this is going to work for you guys. 
And it would look like you are choosing celibacy, like you are choosing marriage, like, like this is going to be difficult. So I said, I'm not going to ask you to make a decision tonight. If you decide tomorrow that you want to follow Jesus, give me a call. You can come to our house church meeting. That's when we used to meet on Monday nights in that group. And so the next day I'm waiting for a phone call. I finally get a phone call at like 15 minutes to our house church time. And the guy goes, are you guys still meeting tonight? I said, yeah. He goes, all right. The kids came home from grandma's house. The three-year-old has been walking all over the house all day going, where's the, scare- or, where's the little girl? I can't find the little girl. He said, we have had peace like we've never had in this house. We slept through the night. We're ready to follow Jesus. We both decided we're in. They gave their lives to Jesus, immediately started sleeping in separate bedrooms. He had some uh, injuries and things that incapacitated him, so she's still in the house as a caregiver for the kids. He puts a ring in the ribbon of the Bible and proposes to her, and there's a whole wonderful story. And there's more to this that doesn't pertain to the topic tonight that maybe you'll hear another time. It was awesome. Like they start coming to house church, their lives got turned around. It was incredible. The kingdom of darkness is attracted to darkness. There's stuff that people have in their lives. There is stuff that some of you have in your life that is attracting darkness. Yeah, yeah. See, just because a door is open doesn't mean any thieves have come in yet, okay? But if the door is open, you're vulnerable to thieves. Now, here's another thing. A lot of times in, uh, in deliverance ministry, I'll hear people use terms like, you know, you gave the devil legal access with this, you know, sin that you're in and stuff. I don't like that term. There's a reason because they're there illegally. The Bible says you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. In other words, that body doesn't belong to that demon. That body doesn't even belong to you. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You belong to Jesus. And so he's actually the only one who has the authority to decide who gets to be in the house. The issue is, as a tenant, you left the door open. (laughs) If someone leaves a door open at someone's house, and a thief comes in and steals everything, it is not suddenly legal just because someone left the door open. It is still illegal. And so you can just cast it out. That's pretty simple. (laughs) Why does that matter? It's because when you look at, like, gosh, here's the thing. I've read a bunch of books on deliverance, and every single one that I've read says, you want to make sure that the person wants to be free before you cast out the demon. I'll show you why in a second, why people say that. But I'll also tell you this, I disagree with them. I'll tell you why in a moment. Let's finish this this story first. They begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Verse 11, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake where they drowned. That was a bummer for those demons. They really thought they found a new house. And uh, Verse 14, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. What? You're making everything out here clean. (laughs) We don't want any of this. We want to live the way we're living. We don't want to be confronted with the light. Sometimes you'll encounter this. I've encountered this in family situations with, you know, somebody gets free and then the family's like, I don't want you in my house anymore. Like, do you see what happened? (laughs) Hmm. Verse 16, those who, I'm sorry, verse 17, then the people began to plead, leave the region. Verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, 
Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, which is the 10 cities, how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Wow. That's exciting. There's something about deliverance ministry that is like dramatic. It's like Jesus on display. Like there was a woman in Uganda that I chased around a field. She's galloping on all fours. I use two legs. And the whole way around the field, I'm going, stop it, stop it, stop right now in Jesus' name. Because I don't like letting demons make puppets out of people. And most of the time when I say stop it now, they stop. Like Jesus said to a demon one time, be quiet, right? And it just stops. So I'm like, this demon does not have the right to mess with this person's body. Jesus paid for that body. It's his. And in Jesus' name, I've got authority. For whatever reason, this was one of those pesky boogers, and it just kept running around, galloping around the field. I come up on, you know, behind him, stop, come out in Jesus' name. We get to the back of this crowd of people because we were doing an outdoor evangelistic thing. I get to the back, and the woman screams and falls to the ground. And I get down on my hands, and I grab her hand, and I help her sit up. And I look at her in her eyes, and she looks at me. Someone else rushes over and puts a blanket around her shoulders and says something to her in their language. And I'm like, okay, it looks like we've got aftercare. This is good. I moved on to the next thing because there was all kinds of demons manifesting at this thing. Come to find out later, that was the village crazy lady who always walked around on all fours. But she sits up in her right mind and starts talking for the first time. (sighs) Instantly in her right mind. We go back to Pastor Paul's house. This is 45-minute motorcycle ride away. And then later that night, a couple of guys from the village show up, and they said the head witch doctor for the region lives in that village, and his wife was there at the meeting, and she said that when the evil spirits started taking over people's bodies, she said, I expected the Christians to beat drums to get them to calm down, but instead they just spoke words, and it worked, and I've never seen authority like this in anyone, even my husband. And I want to follow this Jesus. Tell the Mzungu, the white man, tell the Mzungu to come back to the village so he can pray with me to receive Jesus. I said to these men, because they they were both from the church that we were planting there, and I said to them, I want you two to go back and tell her to pray with you. And if she doesn't want to, tell her, then you don't want Jesus, you want the Mzungu. This is not about his authority, it's about Jesus' authority. But if she will pray with you, she'll be saved. I never heard what happened after that. But you see, there's something where Jesus goes on display. It's awesome. Uh, Matthew chapter 12. This is that one, the reason that people say, make sure that people know or that people actually want to be free. Verse 43. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. And so people are like, you don't want people ending up worse off by casting out demons that it's just going to come back. You don't want to do that. Make sure they want to be free. The problem is the very next sentence. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. In other words, Jesus is going around driving out all these demons and he knows essentially every one of these people is going to end up worse off than if I hadn't driven out those demons. What? Why? Why would Jesus do that? Like, that seems like a terrible idea. Here's the thing. Demons don't have the Holy Spirit, so they don't have self-control. And if they don't have self-control, that makes them entirely predictable. And so even though they are utterly rebellious against God, they can't stop themselves from rebelling, and that makes them so predictable they become unwitting pawns in accomplishing God's will. Why? Because they make people miserable in their sin. <laughs> yeah. And you should be miserable in your sin, right? Like, we ought not be comfortable in a place of sin. 
And if one demon was not enough of a stimulus to convince you that you need repentance, maybe seven more will help. (laughs) You need a greater stimulus. (laughs) And so Jesus knows, like, drive out one demon. The person knows where they got free, how they got free. If they end up worse off, where where are they going to go? He's like, I'm starting a movement, man. I'm lighting people on fire and sending them out. And they're going to burn just like me. And those demons are going to run to them just like they run to me. And these people are going to get free. He wasn't worried about it. So I stopped asking people if they want to be free. They're under all kinds of torment anyway. Here's the thing. Gosh, there's so many more stories I want to tell, and there's just like not enough time to tell them all in. Jesus, what one should I share? (laughs) Let me tell you a few of my stories, me personally. Because here's the thing. Let let me set this up with some theology and then I'll tell you a story. Everybody wants to know, can a Christian be demon-possessed? Especially everybody in this room because you all are Christians. If you're not, just hang on, we'll get there. But you get the idea. Like, like, am I vulnerable to this thing? The the term demon-possessed does show up in certain translations of English Bibles. The thing is, it's not actually the literal Greek. The Greek word there is... uh, uh, daimonizomai, and, and you could literally render it demonized or influenced by a demon. It, it doesn't mean possessed by, owned by, right? Like, they don't own you. It's, it's a term that maybe is descriptive of what it looks like when a demon starts taking over in somebody. It's like, that person is possessed. Like you, like, you see it like that. But that's not the truth of what's going on. They are influenced by a demon. So here's really the question. Can Christians be influenced by demons on any scale? Like if this is a spectrum of like severe to not so severe. Well, well, sure. If you couldn't, why would we have scriptures like, you know, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one, let alone put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes or, or uh, you know, be sober minded and alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour or, or uh, uh, don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil a foothold, right? So like there's a whole lot of scriptures there showing that Christians can be influenced by demons. The question is, to what degree, right? And so I have a confidence that as a Christian, with an awakened spirit, empowered by the living God, right, the amount of influence that an evil spirit is going to get over me is like nothing. Like I I am expecting I'm going to walk in freedom because the shield of faith extinguishes all the fiery darts of the evil one. Like there's not, there's no exception there. All of them. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, I have given you the authority to walk on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means harm you. That's a promise. I had a kid one time, he's got, he's like full on manifesting a demon. I say kid, he was like 16 years old and he was big. And he comes charging at me and I just sat there not even budging. And he comes up, hauls back his fist, goes to lunge. His father is terrified. This was over in Hamtramck. He lunges at me, and I just sat there and did not flinch. And as his fist comes up, his knuckles touch me, and he brushes me with his hand. Like I didn't even, I I felt his hand brush me, but it wasn't a punch. And I just sat there. And the father is like jumping in, grabbing his son, restraining him. I said, no, no, let go, let go, let go. And the kid like throws his dad off of him. And he comes at me again and he starts pummeling me like this and nothing's happening. He's just, he's brushing me. I'm like, thanks, my shirt was a little dusty. (laughs) Like nothing shall by any means harm you. (laughs) I was in Haiti. There was... 50 kids manifesting demons that had been dragged into this other classroom. And I walked in the room just to make sure it was real. I sat down on the floor in the midst of all this thrashing because I knew if they start kicking me, they're just putting on a show. But if they can't touch me, then this is legit. And sure enough, it was legit. And a whole lot of freedom came after that. That's a whole other story. I'm telling you, this is, this is way more common than you think. 
Now here's the thing, as a Christian, shield of faith extinguishes fiery darts of the evil one. What happens when I put my shield down? You get hit. And so anytime I'm getting hit by the kingdom of darkness, my very first question is, Lord, did I drop my shield of faith? Did I stop trusting you with simple trust? Because that's all it is, is simple trust. God's got me. I've got a good father. He loves me. That's where your protection comes from. You, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Come on. This is real freedom. But there are vulnerabilities. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil a foothold. That means bitterness can give a foothold to the enemy. If, if you have not forgiven somebody that you need to forgive, there is room for the enemy to get his nasty little toenails in there and hang on. You see? Yeah, strife, greed, all of it. If you want a list of them, go look at Ephesians 4. That's where that whole sun go down on your anger thing is. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. Unwholesome talk, coarse joking, drunkenness, yeah, lust, uh-huh. There's a whole lot of stuff. So here I was, uh, grew up in church, this church building, by the way, <laughs> and, and loved Jesus, had wonderful godly parents. Seven or eight years old, I was abused by some older boys in my neighborhood. And I'll just leave it at that for those who are extra sensitive or maybe there's kids watching the video later, but you know what I mean. And it went from, I'm the victim to this is the game we play. And before long, I'm dragging other kids into this game. And it was a mess. A kid down the street showed me a, a magazine that his dad had uh, that was hidden under his dad's bed. And uh, I was addicted. I couldn't get free. As Soon as we had the internet in our house, I was keeping myself up till two or three in the morning when the dial-up internet wouldn't wake up my parents screeching, right? Because I wanted to look at stuff I shouldn't. And I was addicted. And the thing was, here's the worst part. I really, really loved Jesus. And I desperately wanted to be free. And I tried so stinking hard to get free. And the most I could ever make it was maybe two weeks. And I'd be like, man, you made it two weeks. Way to go, man. You just crossed a new, you know, record. And it was almost, you know, you know how the scripture says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty heart before a fall. It was like God was going, oh, you thought you did that without grace? Watch what you can do without grace. And he removed that hand of favor that was empowering me to live free for those two weeks. And I fell right back into the same stuff. And I hated it. And I hated myself. And I hated the boys for what they'd done to me. And I hated the friends on, down the street for introducing me to this stuff. And I, I hated God for letting it happen. Even though I really loved Jesus. I know there's some theological issues with that, but this is how emotions work, you know? To make another long story short, I was clinically depressed, would throw fits of rage. I was an angry person. I just shared this story with someone at my house uh, the other day, and, and she goes, you kidding me? You're like Santa Claus 24-7. <laughs> like, are you calling me fat? <laughs> but... But it was like, uh, you know, like I was completely, I was, I was hurting. I could put on a good face at church. I was hurting. I was scared. I was addicted and I was lost. My family and I went to another church. A, a, an evangelist came. He said, uh, if you've got habits in your life or whatever, Jesus wants to set you free. And I was too proud to go forward for the altar call because I didn't want anybody to know I'm one of those people, that I've got issues. We just started coming here. They let me on the worship team. I don't want them finding out I got issues. And then he did his altar call, and everybody in the youth group got up, including our youth pastor, and I was too proud to be the only person sitting down. That pride got a hold of me, 
And I went and stood in the back with the other students and hoped that the guy didn't come over to me, but he did. And he said, what can I pray for you about? And I mumbled. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 what? I said, I have a problem with lust. His response, oh, is that all? Best response I could have ever asked for. I thought it was the biggest, most impossible thing in the world. And he was like, that thing? I've seen that one go a lot of times. He goes, spirit of lust and sensuality, leave right now in Jesus' name. Now, I'm not telling you this has to happen to you. I can just tell you what happened to me. I flew backwards six feet, landed on the floor, and when I sat up, I was thinking clean thoughts. I wasn't looking at every girl in the youth group. I was free. And I'm like, what? I'm like, this is crazy. It was like everything looked brighter. It was awesome. I went and shared with the story with my youth pastor the next day or the day after. And he goes, would you like to share that story with the youth group? I said, yeah. I came to the youth group. I told everybody about the addiction and about the, you know, the, 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 what, I, the, what happened to me, getting free from this demon. They're all happy. Other guys start coming forward and confessing stuff. They're getting free of things. It was awesome. After about six months, I had shared my story with everybody I knew to share it with. And at that point, I was like, well, I've done it. I've accomplished the goal. And that's when this little thought crept in. You know, you could go right back to the same stuff you used to do, and nobody would be any damaged because they've all heard the testimony, so no harm done. You can go have some fun. Remember what Jesus said would happen. The Spirit comes back looking for a place to rest. That, where do you think that thought came from? I went right back into it, and I was worse off then than I ever had been before. More addicted, in deeper darkness, and that's when I went and helped plant a church in Fowlerville and was leading worship and youth ministry. I'm a church planter, and I was deeply, deeply addicted. How did I get free? Pastor Dan took us on a retreat with another church actually the pastored by my former youth pastor. And at that retreat, the Lord started working on my heart and I forgave those boys in my neighborhood for the abuse. It was the first time I had actually allowed myself to take an account for it and say that wasn't okay and I accept that it was real and I forgive them. And when I forgave them, this time I didn't fly backwards and hit the floor. It was just the foothold was gone. The enemy had no more grip and I was free. I'm telling you, like, these access points matter. They matter. Hmm. I'm not going to read you this scripture. I just want to tell it to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. And he said, we cast down every thought and pretension of the heart that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we make it obedient to Christ. Hmm. Strongholds. Remember Jesus said, the demon comes back and finds the house swept clean and empty? I've often heard it taught that means you gotta get the person filled up with the Holy Spirit. But I have seen people go through that process of getting filled up with the Holy Spirit and still end up worse off than they were. It happened to me. I was a spirit-baptized believer, full of the Spirit, going out praying for people and everything, and stuff came back. So just practically speaking, that interpretation doesn't bear out in my experience. So then the question is, what are you supposed to do? The problem isn't that the house is empty. The problem is there's a house there is a structure of the heart that is there. It is made of thoughts and pretensions of the heart. It's called a stronghold, which is another word for a castle. Just because you have a stronghold doesn't mean you have a demon. But again, if the house is there and the door is open, they've got a foothold. They've got a place where they can take up residence and hang out. So when I drive a demon out of somebody, when I got a demon cast out of me, the, the best thing that can happen 
is the stronghold being demolished. Destroying that bitterness and rage with forgiveness. You see? I wish there was time tonight to tell you more stories. I, I have hundreds of them. And they all come down to this same truth. That Jesus empowers his people. That his name has authority. That people can be instantly free. Ah, I'm like, too many stories coming. Pastor Joseph in Uganda, he runs a Compassion International Center and a school and a church and a Bible school. He co-runs it with Pastor Paul. And then, guess what? He used to be completely out of his mind, insane in a mental hospital. Something about a witch doctor putting a curse on him in high school, and he just went off the deep end. And he's in a padded room in a mental hospital, and this Pentecostal couple comes to the hospital and says, give us your most difficult case. And they walked in there, and they said, come out of this man right now in the name of Jesus. Instantly, and he's in his right mind. And now Pastor Joseph runs all this stuff. Like, this is the kind of freedom that's available. I, I wrote something down in my phone. I feel like this is really important. Healthy deliverance discerns, confronts, and casts out demons. Unhealthy deliverance ministry speculates that people have demons. <laughs> what I don't want you to do after this teaching is walk out at every little thing you see like, I wonder if that's a demon. Some of you are already thinking of people in your life <laughs> You might even be married to them. <laughs> they might be here tonight. And you're already thinking of them. And you're like, I wonder if that one's, a, if they got a demon, maybe that's their problem. <laughs> Deliverance ministry is not about making your life easier by getting all the difficult people in your life, their lives together. Oh man, wouldn't it be great if I could just cast this thing out of my husband and then I don't have to deal with all this anymore. There's probably more going on than just that. There might not be a demon at all. In fact, it might be you. <sighs> Come on. So what I don't want us to do is go out speculating about demons, but if one manifests, or if by the Spirit you truly discern one, now it's time to do something, and you just tell it to leave in Jesus' name. And I've had times when, you know, I, I had a guy I led to the Lord and I'm sitting in a car with him and, and I'm like, uh, you know what, I, I'm, I'm just going to pray for you. And as I'm praying, I said, uh, you know, Father, thank you for your love for him and I pray that you would help him with this decision he's made to follow you. And right now I tell every unclean spirit, impure spirit to leave him in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for always being with him, for filling him with your presence. You see how I did sneaky deliverance ministry there? Like I just snuck it into the prayer. And when I finished praying, I said, amen. And the guy goes, wow. I said, what? He goes, it just feels like, <sighs> what a description. Most deliverance ministry, there's no showdown. There's no conversation with the demon. There's no chasing the galloping woman around the field. Most of the time, it's just, <sighs> and people feel free. And I want you to go into this expecting freedom to happen even when it doesn't look dramatic. And I want you to ask people if they're, if, you know, what, what's happened? What are you feeling right now? If they say, I'm feeling panicked, what should you do? Say, that's okay. Don't, don't be afraid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this thing to leave. Why do I do it that way? Because if they're in fear, that's another one of those strongholds. So I want to put the person at ease because I'm ministering to the person and then tell the demon to leave. You see, like this doesn't have to be a big show. It's really simple. And you can do it with love and compassion and gentleness and a smile on your face. You can do it with a song. David played a harp and the evil spirit would leave Saul. It's in the Bible. You see? When you're ministering to people, pay attention to what you feel. I've had times where I'm ministering deliverance to somebody. Actually, at one time I was praying for healing for somebody, and suddenly 
I, I noticed the, like, I started noticing women. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is uncharacteristic for me because I'm free from that and it's been a decade I've been free. Like, I, it's one thing to notice someone's pretty, but it's another thing to notice, right? That's where I was. And I'm like, I could have in that moment been like, uh-oh, I'm not qualified to do deliverance ministry. Instead, I'm like, wait a minute, that's not me. Spirit of lust, leave in Jesus' name. How did you know I was dealing with lust? I'm just picking up on what is going on there. Sometimes you're deliver, ministering deliverance ministry and you start to feel scared. What do you think it is? Spirit of fear. Because you're a spirit baptized, born again believer with the living God in you. You're not a scared person. You're not fearful. That's not who you are. So when you know your identity in Christ, it's really easy to spot that stuff and be like, oh, that's not me. And so you start to feel scared, and instead of cowering and backing down, you just go, spirit of fear, leave in Jesus' name. How did you know I was dealing with fear? You were feeling it. I can't tell you how many times I've had people bring a deliverance ministry case to me, like other Christians, and they're like, I just, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I need you to do this, like it's just not working for me. And I end up casting out a spirit of insecurity and inadequacy and... You see? Like these times when you start thinking, I got to bring in the big guns because I just don't have it. One of two things is going on. Either you've got spiritual doors wide open in your life and you legitimately aren't equipped for it. In which case, yeah, bring in the big guns and then we'll deal with your stuff. Or that spirit is attacking your identity and trying to convince you that you're incapable of ministering. <laughs> All this stuff takes is recognizing what it is that's going on. You've got your spouse in a fit of rage at you, and you start feeling rage build up in you. What do you think's going on? Some of it could be fight or flight, but there also might be something spiritual going on. Now, if you don't know for sure, I don't recommend saying, spirit of rage, leave my spouse right now, because... Uh, that might make the, the person who doesn't have a demon even angrier. But I have ministered under my breath before. Leave right now in Jesus' name. They can hear you. And when I've done that, either the person calms down or nothing changes. Or they get louder. Either way. If nothing changes, I just am like, okay, I guess it wasn't that. But if they get louder or they calm down, I'm like, okay, found one. In our school of ministry, we have a whole like two hour class on this subject and there's just not enough time to talk about it all. In fact, I shared things with you tonight that I didn't even teach the school of ministry. So ta-da! If you wanna learn more, join the school of ministry next year. It's gonna be awesome. But here's, here's what I wanna do tonight. We've run over time. I, I just, I felt like we needed to make sure those little bits at the end were really fresh in our minds. Cause here's what's gonna happen. We're going to have people coming to our house churches that are tormented by the enemy. And they've got plates of sugar laying in front of their door. They're living in darkness. Sometimes, I feel led to pray, to, to share this. Sometimes you're ministering healing to someone and you, st or I, say, I should say deliverance to someone, and you start to feel like, yeah, it's a good thing they came to me. I know exactly what I'm doing. It's probably a spirit of pride. And if you minister in that spirit of pride, you will be agreeing with the demon, not casting it out. Do you see how this works? Like, don't let that stuff in, just let that become part of discernment. Talk to the Holy Spirit. He'll give you the discernment you need. Like, Lord, is that me or is that them? Lord, what are you showing me? What needs to happen? He'll show you. He'll teach you. We're gonna have people who have this stuff. We probably already do. There are probably some of us in this room that are dealing with darkness right now. And I don't know if you've got a demon or if you've just got a door open. <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, I'm expecting all of that stuff to be done tonight. 
I want to see freedom because Jesus made it available and it's easy. Can we pray together? Holy Spirit, you're the one that the scripture says convicts the world of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. You're the one who speaks to our hearts and brings things to our remembrance and gives us the mind of Christ and all of those things. And I ask you, Lord, right now to speak to each one of us if there is any bitterness, anyone we need to forgive, would you speak to us right now? Show us their faces, remind us of their names. Show us if there is any group of people, a family, a, a neighborhood, a gang, a church, that we need to forgive. Here's the thing, maybe, maybe you're seeing faces or names or remembering places and seasons and things that happened and I've never once in my life felt like forgiving. Forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a legal transaction. It's a, it's a decision that the price Jesus paid is sufficient and I don't have to wish that that person would pay for what they did. Jesus paid for what they did. No other sacrifice for sins is necessary. And so forgiveness for me, it doesn't look like me mustering up a feeling of, oh, I forgive. It's not that. You can't do it in your own strength. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Real biblical forgiveness looks like putting the old bitter person that you once were on the cross with Jesus where that person belongs and considering you and your, your bitter self dead and saying, Holy Spirit, would you come and express the forgiveness of Jesus through me? The forgiveness of the one who, while they were crucifying him, said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That Jesus, would you come and live that through me? And so right now, if, if you're recognizing there are people you need to forgive, I don't want you to simply say, I forgive you. I want you to repent and surrender your bitterness to the cross. Holy Spirit, come in a new way. Move among us. Thank you. And now, in the name of Jesus, I want you to say, I choose to forgive those people or that person. Say their name if you have to. I choose to forgive this person for what they did. Put words to it. Open your mouth. Don't let it just be a floating thought. Make it real. I can already feel it. Some of you are getting free already. Just like happened to me, the demons just losing their grip. They have nothing to hold on to. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I command every impure spirit, every unclean spirit, every spirit of infirmity, every spirit of rage, every spirit of malice, every spirit of deceit, every spirit of self-hatred, every spirit of hatred. Go, right now, in the name of Jesus. Leave. and never come back. Jesus.
Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Some of you have doors open. You recognize there's stuff in your life that just doesn't line up with Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. God doesn't have any doors open to the enemy. He's truly righteous and holy. And that's who you're created to be like. Wow. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we're all members of one body. One of the falsehoods that needs to be put off is pretending. Pretending you're someone you're not. Trying to put on a good face. Let's just be real with each other. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Did you hear that? The words coming out of your mouth aren't for your benefit, it's for theirs. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Holy Spirit, if there is any way any of us have grieved you, we're sorry. And we receive your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price. Thank you, Father, for your love. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. How do you get rid of it? You put it on the cross. Jesus, I consider that person dead. And when you start to feel those feelings later where you want to jump back into that fit of rage, you go, nope, uh uh-uh. That's not who I am. You spirit of rage, you get away from me in Jesus' name. You do not belong here. I'm encouraging you to take authority for yourself, for your own good. Don't wait for someone else to cast it out. You've got the authority. You're a child of God. You don't have to let these things in. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Lord, help us. Lord, any areas of our lives where we've left the door open, we put it on the cross and we consider it dead with Christ in the name of Jesus. And we don't just put off the old self. Lord, we also put on the new self that is created to be like you in true righteousness and holiness. We believe that the new creation is real that you have done a good work in us and you will be faithful to carry it through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you. You're so good. So good. Jesus. Here's how I want to finish tonight. If you you know, just need prayer for any random thing, or maybe you feel a need to confess sin to somebody, um, then I, I want you to just find someone in the room and you're, you're going to ask them to pray for you. Someone you trust, someone you know, 
and, and have that moment together, okay? But there's another possibility in the room tonight, and that is right now, you feel like some spirit got stirred up, not the Holy Spirit, but you felt something stirring up while, while that prayer time was going on and you don't feel like it's left. I'm expecting freedom tonight. I've been set free from three different demons as a Christian, and I will not look on you with any bit of condemnation. I know exactly what's going on. In fact, one of them was a week before I started traveling ministry while I was a pastor with credentials. Had a spirit come out of me. So listen, there is no judgment, no condemnation. It is, this is about freedom. It's about saying no more. Am I just going to wallow in this thing? I'm done. I feel something that's still there and it's not letting go. I want you to pray for me. If that's you, I want you to come to the front here. So let's all stand up. Everybody stand. Jesus, thank you.